Hi, Fourth Reformed. Uh, it's good to be with you today, even if it's uh, in video form. Uh, by now, you know that we're sitting at home today because uh, we have COVID going through our house for the second time in a year, uh, which, as you can imagine, isn't a lot of fun. Uh, I had hoped to preach this sermon face to face with you this morning, but but here we are. Uh, I guess one benefit of recording a message like this is uh, that unlike last week, my iPad and my microphone shouldn't be an issue for you all. This past Sunday, we gathered uh, in the evening for our twice a month prayer gathering. And, uh, and we've been doing this now since September, and it's been fantastic. As we gathered for prayer this past Sunday evening, uh, we asked two questions of God, and then we spent time in listening prayer. Uh, I know some of you have not participated in this yet, but I really would encourage you to come out because it's an amazing time of being together in community and hearing from God. One of the questions we asked God on Sunday night was, what do you want us to do with our property and our resources? What do you want us to do with our property and our resources? And then we spent about five to eight minutes in listening prayer. And as I closed my eyes to listen to what the Holy Spirit might lay upon my heart, I had this immediate sense that I needed to go out to the field. Now, I wanted nothing to do with that because Sunday night was cold, like bone chilling cold and windy. And I didn't have my jacket with me at that moment. I didn't want to go outside, but, but God just kind of pressed into me and I'm like, okay, I, I got to go. <laughs> so I ran, well, I didn't run, out to the field, uh, kind of huddled up in cold and got to the entrance of the field, sort of where the farm stand used to be. And, and I just asked God, okay, what do you want me to see? And God highlighted for me in that moment uh, some rabbit tracks on the ground. In the darkness, they were visible. And, and, and I just had the sense that I needed to follow those rabbit tracks. And so I did. I, I started following the rabbit tracks out into the farm to see where it was that God was going to lead me and what he wanted me to see. And, and it was interesting because as I followed those tracks, they went to some of the high tunnels that are out in the field. Uh, and it almost appeared, I'm no tracker, right? But it almost appeared as though the rabbit went to each tunnel, peered inside, and then scurried on, like didn't go in in the tunnel, but just peeked and kept moving. And so and so I, I kind of followed the lead of the rabbit. And I know this might sound crazy, but I, but this is what I did. I, I peeked into each tunnel and guess what I saw? Uh, it's no surprise. Uh, rot and decay, right? It's the end of the growing season. It's winter. It's been frosted. Everything's cold. Of course, there's nothing living in any of these tunnels. It's just hundreds of feet of rot and decay everywhere and maybe a little bit of stench. And so I went to the next tunnel and I just kept following the rabbit's tracks, not sure of what God wanted me to see, but each tunnel was the same. Each tunnel was this rot and this decay that was that was just sort of depressing to look at but finally in the last tunnel near the entrance there were two plants that i think are swiss chard i really don't know but that's what it looked like to me but what was interesting even as i saw that swiss chard in that last tunnel is that the rabbit only peered in and then went on his way he didn't eat the Swiss chard. Here is some living plant matter for the rabbit to eat, and yet the rabbit did not eat. Now, I sat there looking at that for just a moment, and then I got the sense that God was like, all right, you've seen what you need to see. You can go back inside. And so I did, but I got to tell you, I was utterly perplexed. I wasn't really sure what God was trying to communicate in that moment to me, and and why I had to go out to the field to see what was sort of obvious. But, but I really believe he wanted me to go out there and see all of those things. I didn't really get any clarity in our prayer time that night around what it, what it was that I had seen out there. And, and this week, as I've just kind of wrestled with some of that imagery in my mind, and as I've studied the sermon, uh, studied for this sermon, I, I feel like God has maybe put some things together. And perhaps as we go through the message, or as we go through the text today, and as we enter into this message, you will see some of those connections as well. But if not, I'm going to hopefully try to bring this all together at the end. We're going to read our text now this morning. It's Romans 6, 1 through 14. And so hopefully you have your Bibles open already. If not, uh, open them and follow along with us as we read the word of the Lord together. 
What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as though who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. And there ends the reading of the word of God. As you might have noticed as we read this text together, it comes in the middle of a discourse that Paul is already having with the Roman people. Paul's talking about grace and sin and the law, and he asks this question at the outset of our text, saying, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? The, the, the question follows the last chapter clearly because he's stating in that chapter the consequences of the law and, and, and all of that business. And, and as he's talking about the consequences of the law, he actually starts to talk about sin. Because the law was set up, check this out, to show us how to walk in relationship with God the Father. And so that makes sense, right? We even talked about this a bit last week. But because we suffer with hard-heartedness or spiritual cardiomyopathy, the law actually just gives us more opportunity to sin by disobeying God, right? It seems kind of contrary to what God was trying to do, but but that's just because of our hard-heartedness. God gave us the law so we would know how to be in relationship with him, but we took the law that should have given us a clear relationship and instead turned it into multiple opportunities to sin even more, because now we know how specifically we can disobey God. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our sin is, which we are constantly committing against God, is met with grace. Right? Our sin should have been met with judgment and condemnation. We deserve it. But instead, our sin is met with grace because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been paid for. We have been set free. So because of Jesus, our sin is met with grace. It seems like some of the Roman church was operating by the logic of, well, if this is the case, if we can keep sinning and grace is just going to keep multiplying, then let's keep sinning because God's grace is endless. And sin, therefore, maybe doesn't even matter. And what the Romans were doing, what others in the church were doing was simply cheapening grace. Which is why when Paul starts this section with the question, should we keep sinning so that grace can increase, he emphatically says, by no means. And the reason is that we have died to our sin with Jesus. You see, grace given to us by Jesus through his death and resurrection is not permission to sin, it doesn't mean we can keep on sinning because we know that there is endless grace and forgiveness waiting for us. Grace is actually a constant reminder that our sin died on the cross with Jesus. Grace is something that should be softening our hearts towards God so that we can love him more. 
and walk with him out of love and obedience. But that's not how we often operate, right? Paul talks a little later in in chapter 6, in verse 6, and and, and kind of brings us into a new perspective where he says that we are no longer slaves to sin. Like one of the reasons we shouldn't keep sinning is because we are no longer slaves to it. Now that statement alone implies that before we knew Jesus, we were in fact slaves to sin. And if we are slaves to sin, then it implies this. Slave at one, er, sin at one point was our slave master. In other words, there has been a point in each of our lives where in some sense we were owned by sin. Now, from what I, what I have often noticed in the world, is that people, before they know who Jesus is, they're often content to live in a way that sin does own them. Right? They, I don't think anyone would talk about it that way, but that seems to be the case, right? Like when we're before we know Jesus, we operate in our sinfulness any way we want, and it really owns us, even though we think we're living in incredible freedom, we're actually living in bondage. And the reality is that sometimes even when we do know Jesus, we are content to let certain sins in our lives become our master. Because the old life that's been crucified with Jesus, it still wants to cling on. We're familiar with it. We know it. We want to chase it. And we know, or at least we believe, that if we do chase it, again, grace and forgiveness are waiting, so it doesn't matter. One of my pastor friends recently told me this story about a member of his church. Uh, the member of his church walked out on his wife to have an affair with another woman. The elders confronted this man and, and really tried to put him in his place and, and call him to repentance and bring him back to Jesus. But this guy was just belligerent. And so my friend said to him, you mean to tell me that if God was here, physically here right now in this room, and you could look him in the eye, you would tell God you're going to do whatever you want. The man thought about it for a moment and then simply said, yeah. That's hard heartedness, right? But that's also That's also sin becoming a slave master in the life of this person. And and sometimes it's hard to imagine a reaction like that. But I think that to some degree, we all operate like that guy. Each of us has a sin or more sins in our lives that we know need to die with Jesus. We know we have things that we do each day that don't please God. And yet, I don't know what our motivation is. It it seems like we either don't care, right? We don't care that we're displeasing God. We're just going to go on doing what we're going to do. Or we cheapen God's grace with the belief that he ultimately doesn't care because his grace is so big, it'll cover it all. We all live this way to some degree. We all have things in our lives, some some piece of us that is still part of our old self that needs to die with Jesus, but we just won't let it go. And we cling to grace as the reason we don't have to. What Paul is telling the church in Rome, he's telling us today, that's not the way it should be. We are united to Christ through his death and resurrection. And when the gospel takes root in our heart, when we understand and come to know the love of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross and in the grave, we are no longer slaves to sin. Sin is no longer our master. When we are united with Jesus, Jesus becomes our master. And when we willingly chase sin of any kind whatsoever apart from Jesus, we are essentially saying 
that our sin is a better master than Jesus. We're like the Israelites in the wilderness, following God, listening to Moses, grumbling and saying, we wish we were still back with Pharaoh in Egypt. When we chase after our sin, either cheapening grace or because we don't care, we are chasing the Pharaoh instead of God. We're chasing bondage. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we gain new life in Jesus. Our hearts and our minds are regenerated by the Spirit as the gospel takes hold. And that purpose of all of that happening is so that we can know God the Father more, so that we can know the Son more, so that we can know the Spirit and follow them in obedience, listening to them and, and, and loving them and, and letting the grace of God transform our hearts so that we can walk further away from sin. And while all of that regeneration is happening, it's an ongoing process. We're still being sanctified. It means we're saved, but we're still being saved because there's still sin in us. We're not perfect yet, and we live in a sinful, fallen world. Our hearts still pursue the taint of sin. And when we're not careful, when we let our guard down, when we stop pursuing Jesus, it is so easy for us to listen to our old master who is whispering and shouting, come home. And sometimes we will go because again, we think our old master is a better master. But listen, violent anger is not a better master than Jesus. Living in lies is not a better master than Jesus. Jealousy and envy are not better masters than Jesus. Sex and sexuality are not better masters than Jesus. You and me are not better masters than Jesus. Grace isn't permission for us to chase our sinful master wherever we want. Grace is, grace is God showing us sin has owned us but he has freed us. When we really comprehend the love and the grace of Jesus, we do not desire to abuse that grace, but we really do seek to live in obedience to our Father. When we get a taste of freedom from the old sinful master, it's a beautiful experience, right? I, some of you have really, truly experienced this. You, maybe you've confessed your sin to somebody and experienced grace from them like as an extension of coming from God as they've embraced you and said, we love you and, and we are with you and God forgives you and, and we're going to walk this journey together. This is what James 5 is talking about when he says, confess your sins to one another and be healed. When we really step into freedom and bring our, sl our sin slave master into the light, he loses power. The chains are broken. We experience real freedom. It honestly is incredible. When, when I think about all of the stuff we've been talking about this morning, it gives me the image of Andy Dufresne from the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, I'm not telling you to go home and watch it today because it's, uh, it's not a soft movie. But Andy Dufresne is wrongfully committed and he breaks out of prison one night by crawling through the prison sewer drain. He's covered and surrounded with the most foul smelling waste you can imagine. But when he finally emerges out of that drain, it is storming outside and the rain washes the filth 
away and he stands arms raised in victory. This is a picture, I believe, of what the grace of God should do in our lives. The grace of God should not make us think, I should crawl back into the sewer drain. The grace of God should, should, should compel us to stand arms raised in victory and celebration because we're cleansed, we're reborn. See, when someone's liberated, they know it immediately. Life changes. And the reality of that time takes, the reality of that change takes some time to sink into our mind and take control of our lives. In other words, here's what I think we all struggle with. We all struggle with this. We know that we are not slaves to sin, but it takes us a long time to actually live like free people. We struggle, right? Even though we're free. Back to the field. You were probably wondering if I was ever going to get back to my, my story of the field. This past Thursday, I met with my spiritual director. And I shared my experience that night in the field. And he led me in prayer to just try to help discern what it was God was showing me that night. Because I honestly wasn't sure if God was showing me something personal for me or something for the church. And as we prayed together and listened to God and then talked a little bit after that, I think it's coming into focus a little bit more for me. And and in some ways it relates directly to the sermon. Every day, you and I, who are living in new life in Jesus Christ, face a choice. Before us lies multiple choices, tunnels maybe, if you will, that connect us again to our sinful master. We can choose to step into those tunnels and for a moment escape the harsh reality of the world. Remember, it was windy and cold that night. Those tunnels provided some shelter. We can choose to to step into our our old sinful patterns and and escape for a moment the harshness around us. and pretend that maybe everything's fine, but the reality is, and we know this, we're standing in the middle of rot and filth. There's only one choice that leads to life. That that choice that leads to life is a choice that we are called to take every day. There are multiple options that we can take, that we can step into that are, again, filled of rot and death, But there is one choice that has life in it. And even with that choice, we have to choose to not just take that choice, but to eat of the life that is there. Every day, we can choose to follow our sinful slave master, or we can step into the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ that is offering us new life offering us the opportunity to come and to eat and to believe. We either pursue our new life in Jesus or we pursue our old life without Jesus. Jesus is saying, come with me. Choose my grace. Let it transform you and renew you and cleanse you. People of God, you are called to live this new life. You have been given new life in Jesus Christ. And he has said to each of you today, follow me, come with me. And this is where I think the the ending words of Paul are so important, where he says, don't offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as as those who have been brought from death to life. This is who you are. You've been brought from death to life. And so people of God, choose life and step today out of the death of your sin. Choose life today and pray that the Spirit of God will transform your heart. Choose life today 
and repent of your sinfulness and let the grace of Jesus Christ wash over you and give you new joy and victory in him. People of God, choose life today and live for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can open your word together and we thank you that we can uh, be confronted with this reality, Lord, that, that we have been given a new life in Jesus Christ. And yet, Lord, we know that we so often choose the old life. We, we are drawn to that sinful slave master. And so, Father, today I pray for myself and for this body that you would give us freedom from our sin, that you would help our old self in its sinfulness to die and go away and help us, Lord God, to cling to the life we have in Jesus, a life of freedom and grace and forgiveness. God, help us by the power of your spirit and the message of the gospel to embrace the new life we've been given through your son. Father, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.